Hello, everyone. My name is Vedhavi Fadnes. I'm a product manager at Microsoft Excel, and I'm here today to talk with you about how to deal with uncertainty as product managers. Minimizing uncertainty and finding out the right next step for your product is something that product managers spend most of their time on in their careers. And so I thought that I'd like to share some of the learnings I've had so far in my career that help me deal with uncertainty uh, in an effective manner. I'm really excited to share my learnings with you, and I really hope that they add some value to you. So let's get started. All right, so before we talk about how to deal with uncertainty, I think it's important that we spend some time talking about why do we want to minimize uncertainty and what are some of the areas that we must focus on. So as a product manager, what do you think your most important task is? I think that it is to build a product that is successful. Uh, what I mean by successful product is a product that satisfies our customers and is profitable for our business. So this product success is really dependent on three things. Product desirability, feasibility and viability. Product desirability means that there are enough number of customers in the market that have a specific need or a pain point that this product or idea solves for. Hopefully, uh, that pain point is recurrent, meaning that customers will keep coming back to your product and using it for a foreseeable future. Product feasibility means that you have the means, resources, time, budget, partnerships, uh, expertise and dependencies you need to build a product that solves for the pain point that you have identified efficiently. And product viability means that at some point in the future, you'll be able to generate revenue streams and hopefully profit for your business using the product that you've built. Um, so to build a successful product, it's really important um, that you are working with an idea or a pain point that um, you know customers actually need solved uh, something that you can build and something that you can monetize uh, in the future um, and that's why it becomes really important for uh, product managers to, um, to to try to minimize uncertainty and risks associated with product desirability feasibility and viability and find that sweet spot uh, at the intersection of these three that actually increases your chances of building a successful product. Uh, and well, in, in short, how do you minimize this uh, uncertainty is uh, you gather evidence that points you in the right direction. And so when you're working with a new idea and your uncertainty is really high because you know very little about anything at all, uh, your only goal, goal should be to gather as much evidence as you can um, that points you uh, in the right direction. So what are some of the sources that you can use to gather evidence and minimize uncertainty? Well, there are three major uh, sources of evidence, customers, competitors, and internal teams. Uh, each of these sources will give you varying degree of uh, information about uh, desirability, feasibility, and viability. Um, and so depending on which uh, uncertainty you're trying to minimize, you might want to pick uh, the best uh, source or sources um, uh, to go to to gather more evidence. For example, like customers, I think, uh, are a major source of gathering evidence related to desirability and viability. Will they be able to tell you a lot about whether you as a team can actually build an effective product for them? Maybe not, right? But your internal teams will have the information you need to determine whether or not uh, building a particular product is feasible for you or not. So if you're working on gathering evidence for feasibility, uh, your internal teams like design, research, engineering, um, data science, other teams that are you know maybe working on related uh, 
uh, feature. Uh, those are the ones that, that you might want to talk to to gather more evidence. Um, and competitors are a moderate source of gathering evidence related to desirability and viability. Um, when I say moderate is because uh, really whether or not uh, customers have a particular pain point is something that only customers can tell you for sure. Uh, competitors will give you a good idea about uh, where our competitors are headed, but don't just do something or follow something that your competitors are doing if you don't have the evidence for it um, from your customers. Um, and uh, in terms of viability, you can you know look at competitors and talk to internal teams again, such as legal, sales, marketing, to sort of uh, determine what price point uh, you want to set for your services, or uh, what is the expected cost or revenue or uh, or, or other things uh, related to viability. All right. So when you are gathering uh, evidence from customers, competitors, or internal teams, uh, just just remember certain rules of thumb. Uh, one is that uh, place higher importance to what uh, your customers are saying uh, compared to what competitors are doing, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, Focus on volume. OK, so even if you're gathering information from customers, focus on how many customers are pointing you in the same direction rather than um, rather than using a single data point or a single anecdote as evidence uh, to proceed in a certain direction. Um, and uh, when it comes to picking which of the three areas to focus on or prioritize, um, I would advise you to prioritize desirability first and try to minimize risks associated with desirability um, and then sort of proceed with feasibility and viability because really at the core of it you want to build a product that your customers want um, you know even if you build a very efficient product um, that uh, that you know someone is willing to pay for if it is not something that a lot of people actually need, uh, you're not going to be very successful in building that product. So focus on desirability above feasibility and viability um, and then move on to those later. OK. So now you know what sources are there to sort of gather more evidence. Uh, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through a framework uh, to tell you how do you gather evidence from these different sources and try to minimize uncertainties that we spoke about. So the first step is to gather weak evidence. Um, what weak evidence is, is uh, it, it, it consists mostly of people's opinions, their beliefs, uh, and their insights from their past experiences or uh, past uh, learnings. Um, some of the modes of uh, gathering weak evidence are trend or competitor analysis, customer interviews, customer surveys, talking to uh, teams internal to your organizations to learn um, from them about their insights from past products, past uh, experiments, and past experiences. Uh, weak evidence, uh, you know, there are there are only so many customers that you can interview. There are only so many team members that you can talk to. There's only so much information available on the trend uh, and, and, and the competitors. And this is why in weak evidence, you do not get significant volume of uh, data points. You have fewer data points in case of weak evidence. Um, and because of that, I would encourage you to not spend too much time on gathering weak evidence. Now, given all this, you might be tempted to just say that, hey, I'm going to skip this step and just gather strong evidence for uh, my assumptions uh, or hypothesis. Well, I would really encourage you to not skip gathering weak evidence for two reasons. One, gathering strong evidence for uh, your assumptions um, is really expensive. Uh, and so you will not be able to gather strong evidence for all of your assumptions. And uh, you can do that in, in um, this step of gathering weak evidence. Second is, although you have uh, fewer data points in case of weak evidence, they can give you some profound insights and point you in the right direction. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can discard things or assumptions uh, 
that will absolutely not work uh, for your product based on the evidence you receive in this step um, and minimize the hypothesis or assumptions that you want to gather strong evidence for. So this is really a critical step that can give you profound insights onto the about the overall high level uh, direction that you want to proceed in. Um, and so do not skip this step, uh, in my opinion. The next step is to remove biases when you're deriving key insights from the evidence that you've gathered. And this is super important because as product managers, you know, you have this really cool idea that you want to work on. You've spent time in gathering weak evidence uh, for it. And at this point, you are really married to the idea and you want it to work. Uh, and this can um, sort of, uh, this can, um, make you analyze the data points or the evidence that you have gathered in a biased way. Uh, and so it is super important that you uh, analyze the information and derive uh, insights in a very non-biased, rational way. Some of the tips that I have uh, for you to sort of remove your biases is, um, you know, consciously try to um, work to disprove your beliefs rather than proving your beliefs. Uh, if you're uh, going um, uh, in, in, in customer interviews or just talking to other teams to gather evidence, have more people join you in those conversations. That way, you know, if if multiple people have different interpretations of, of uh, the information that was shared in those interviews or meetings, um, it'll help you to sort of carefully consider different opinions and viewpoints and come to a rational conclusion. Uh, don't share uh, summaries with with people about what your understanding of the evidence is. I would encourage you to share raw data uh, or raw information that you have gathered uh, as part of your evidence and ask uh, multiple people to review it and share their interpretation of um, uh, of the takeaways uh, from that evidence. Uh, so really cautiously uh, make sure that you uh, are, are uh, uh, analyzing evidence in a very non-biased way um, and driving uh, insights uh, rationally. Okay, so at this point, you have some assumptions that you think uh, might work for your product. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to um, convert your assumptions into key hypotheses. Okay, so hypotheses that are related to desirability might include things like uh, pain points, value proposition, uh, something that will get you engagement. Uh, the ones related to feasibility will talk about resourcing, key activities, partnerships, and the ones related to viability will, um, you know, talk about costs, pricing, profit, um, etc. Now, when you are creating three hypotheses from your assumptions, make sure that your hypothesis follow these three characteristics. One is that your hypothesis is testable, meaning that uh, you can measure your hypothesis and the outcome of it can be uh, a true or a false. So you can confidently say whether your hypothesis failed or not. Um, so make sure that it is testable. So for example, a hypothesis that looks like redesigning the website will increase user engagement is a very poorly formed hypothesis that is not testable, right? Um, and that is because you don't know how you're going to redesign the website or how are you actually measuring uh, increase in user engagement. So if you modified this hypothesis a little bit and, and said something like redesigning the website with design A will increase total time spent on website per user. So now you have a, a measurable, a testable hypothesis uh, that can either fail or succeed based on uh, whether the, the total time spent on the website per user actually increased or not. The second characteristic of a good hypothesis is that it has a clear goal and a success criteria. So a hypothesis that looks like redesigning the website with design A will increase average time spent on the website per user per week by 10% for users between the ages of 20 and 45. This is a very good hypothesis that has a clear goal and, and criteria. You know which customer segment you're working with. You know 
uh, what design you'll use for your experiment, you know which metric you're going to focus on, and you know how much you're you're looking to move that metric to be successful. And the third criteria is that your hypothesis must be atomic. Um, when you're testing a hypothesis, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to figure out whether um, uh, the cause uh, has the effect that you were predicting, right? And so you should really have one cause and effect uh, in a single hypothesis. Don't try to mix multiple variables in a single hypothesis. That, that's not going to give you clear results. Now, once you have your key hypothesis uh, mapped out, what you need to do is you need to prioritize your hypothesis. Uh, you cannot uh, proceed um, to gather more evidence for all the hypotheses you have. And so, um, uh, which is because of constraints, basically, like in real world, you're gonna always gonna be constrained on time, cost, resources, and, and various other things. So you really want to pick a few hypotheses that you want to gather more evidence for, and that's where prioritizing them becomes super important. Uh, one easy way to prioritize your hypothesis is to ask two questions. One is, which of these hypotheses need to be absolutely true for my product to succeed? So you're ordering them based on their importance uh, for success. Uh, and second question you can ask is, uh, which of these hypotheses I lack concrete evidence for? So you're really ordering them first by importance, second by evidence. Uh, and you want to pick the, the hypotheses that are really critical for your product success and you do not have uh, the evidence for yet. And you want to sort of focus on uh, those uh, and then move on to gathering strong evidence for the hypothesis that you picked. Now, strong uh, evidence uh, usually is significant in volume. Uh, it consists of facts, real world settings, what people actually do instead of, you know, their beliefs and opinions. Um, some of the ways of uh, gathering strong evidence are, uh, you know, actually building experiments to test out your hypothesis uh, in, in, in real world. Now, uh, remember that uh, uh, building experiments is costly. And uh, so you really want to be careful uh, when you're um, testing your hypothesis using experiments. So if you can, I'd encourage you to start with building scrappy experiments. Now, I know that this is not always possible, depending on which product you're working for or which organization you work in. Um, but if you can, uh, try to begin with building scrappy experiments that give you information that you need to proceed and then take the next step. Uh, so some of the examples for building scrappy experiments are uh, Wizard of Oz or fake landing pages. So let's say if, um, if you are uh, looking to test the desirability of a particular product um, and um, you don't know whether it's going to work or not, right? Uh, so what you can do is instead of building the entire automated backend for that system, uh, you can build the UI and as customers interact on that UI, you can have actual manual humans uh, sort of um, uh, interacting uh, and, and proceeding or taking users through the next steps. Um, and if that works, if you, if you find uh, a lot of customers engaging with that experience in a way that you were hoping, uh, then as a next step, you can actually uh, invest in building the entire automated backend. Or let's say if you want to understand if if um, if you embed a URL in a web page, uh, will people actually click on it and then consume the content uh, of that URL? Um, if you want to test that in a scrappy way, you can create a fake landing page. You can embed the URL in a web page that, that you want. Once a user clicks on it, you can you know, just give out a message initially that says, hey, coming soon or we'll be live on so and so date um, and then just measure um, uh, how many clicks you get. And if you think that those are significant, um, then you can actually invest in uh, building the experience that that um, uh, that you want to build. So these are some of the ways in which you can gather strong evidence. And because uh, because the experiment is sort of um, experiment gathers significant data points, uh, it is usually a very good indicator of 
what you should do next depending on the result of the experiment uh, if you do not have a lot of users uh, to give you data really quickly you can choose to run experiments for long time and gather data more data points that way so okay so now you have gathered uh, more evidence strong evidence uh, that that you can uh, use again you have to make sure that you remove your biases i cannot stress this enough it is super important to remove your biases when you're analyzing your evidence um, in in cases of experiments um, this is where having um, a hypothesis that has a clear goal and success criteria is really helpful because if you really have a clearly defined success metric um, you know, analyzing the results of the experiment becomes very clear. You either met the goal or you didn't. But let's say if if uh, the results of your experiment are sort of inconclusive, you might be tempted to say that, hey, let's just roll it out to production because it's it's not worsening anything if, if it's not making anything better. Uh, but but this is where uh, removing biases is something that we should remember. Uh, don't do that. Uh, just make sure that you you sort of uh, have multiple people take a look at the raw data and um, uh, get their uh, insights into it as well and remove biases and do the right thing uh, for the product. Okay, so now you went from gathering weak evidence to strong evidence uh, for your key hypothesis. Uh, now what you can do is you can run multiple experiments for the same hypothesis to gather even stronger evidence uh, that points you in the right direction. Um, or you can choose to repeat the entire process to gather more information to add features or, or to remove features that don't work any longer uh, that you already have in the product. Uh, remember that product building is not a linear process. There will never be a time when you have figured it all out. Um, so you you have to keep on gathering more evidence and minimizing uncertainty uh, in, in, in an effort to build a successful product. So you have to keep on repeating this, um, this framework that we spoke about and uh, keep on iterating um, on your product. Okay, so in summary, uh, in order to build a successful product, PMs have to minimize uncertainties associated with product desirability, feasibility, and viability. Uh, when you're uncertain, uh, your only goal, goal should be to gather more evidence that points you in the right direction. Uh, some of the sources that you can use to gather evidence are customers, competitors, and internal teams. Um, Different uh, modes of inquiry will give you different degree of, uh, of of evidence. So you can begin with gathering weak evidence and then move towards strong evidence. Um, uh, and you can you know repeat uh, experiments or, or or run multiple experiments uh, for same hypothesis to gather even stronger evidence. One thing that you have to keep in mind when you're analyzing the evidence you've gathered is to consciously remove your biases in order to really do the right thing uh, for the product and for the customer. And uh, lastly, product development is not a linear process. So you have to keep repeating these steps and keep gathering more evidence to reduce uncertainty and uh, add to your product success. All right, that's it for me today. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Uh, I hope uh, you got some value out of it. Uh, if you have any more questions or any feedback for me on this uh, presentation, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.